Welcome everyone. We'll just give a minute or two for people to enter the Zoom room. And uh, I can see the numbers increasing. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started in just a moment. It's a beautiful blustery day outside, the sun's out. I'm grateful for those of you who have taken the, the time to join us today. And I get to see the numbers and a few of you are still walking in and I think we are, we're pretty much at quorum. Um, I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Rick Page. I'm Dean of the Larner College of Medicine, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for what is truly a special event, and that is our third annual celebration of gender equity in medicine and science. Our inaugural celebration back in the first week of March 2020 was actually the last public in-person event held for more than a year and a half at our college. Through the pandemic, our Gender Equity Steering Committee has done great work presenting regular online sessions, including celebrations such as today's. We participated in gender equity uh, education series all semesters over the last two years, exploring the work of building a just, equal, diverse, and inclusive environment. I believe I've had the opportunity to attend just about every one of these sessions, and I can tell you from personal experience, I've learned so much. Today's event is special. As part of our commitment to education, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Hawkes, Professor of Global Public Health at University College London's Institute for Global Health and the Director of University College's Center for Gender and Global Health. After Dr. Hawk's presentation, I'm pleased that we'll be recognizing five amazing members of our Larner community with this year's Gender Equity Awards, drawn from dozens of worthy nominees. This is an affirmation of the depth of talent and strength we have in our community. Gender equity work at Larner has been propelled by the energetic work of members of the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, or ODEI, the Dean's Advisory Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and our Gender Equity Steering Committee, specifically those who are directly engaged in developing these sessions. I wanna especially thank and acknowledge Dr. Ann Doherty, Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences, and Director for Gender Equity in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Doherty started as liaison just after I arrived for gender equity, and then based on the tremendous success that she's shown and the impact she's had on our community, we actually doubled her uh, allotted time to this effort as she became director for gender equity in October. She's brought exceptional energy, talent, and insight to our efforts to promote gender equity and awareness of gender issues across our community. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Doherty. Thank you so much, Dean Page, and thank you for your allyship and your continued commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Lerner College of Medicine. I truly appreciate it. Good evening and welcome, I guess good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to the third annual Lerner College of Medicine celebration of gender equity in medicine and science. I want to remember that the University of Vermont is located on traditional land of the Western Abenaki people, and we're guests and temporary stewards of these lands and waters. And while it's fitting that we hold this celebration during Women's History Month, and we often use the words woman and man when we talk about gender, we know that gender is in fact socially constructed and occupies a spectrum more than a binary. Furthermore, this is not just about promoting women in medicine and science. This is about an equitable world where everyone is better off. And at the Larner College of Medicine, we intentionally use the term gender equity to reflect this sense of inclusivity. I also find it fitting that we're in the month of March with spring theoretically around the corner, though all of us who've lived in Vermont know that mud season comes first. But it's at this time of year that I start to think about emergence 
I think about plants and tree roots that have stored the light of last summer's sun, and with that strength will foster new green growth. And the growth of the gender equity initiative at the Larner College of Medicine is similar. In 2019, when it was launched, the goal was to deepen a conversation about gender equity in medicine and science and elevate the amazing work done by our faculty, staff, and students. Through the Gender Equity Education Series and its growing attendance, the roots have sunk deep and we are becoming attuned. We recognize that inequities exist and pose barriers to advancement for ourselves and our colleagues. And we've seen such inequities amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know things need to change, but how do we know what direction to take? How do we know what will be impactful? There's a step between conversation and action, and that is focus. How will we focus our collective efforts? As scientists, we follow data and gender equity is no different. It's through data collection and tracking over time that we'll shape our priorities and create the change we know is needed. The data to follow is not only gender pay differences and makeup of senior leadership, though both are vitally important. We also need to look at the safety of our work environment and adjudication processes for complaints. We need to look at the availability of child care and sick day care. We need to look at parental leave policies, timing of standing meetings and flexible work scheduling. And, and we need to look at this, not just for the MDs and PhDs in our organization. Though upwards of 80% of medicine and science is performed by women, only 40% of academic medical center faculty are women. But 90% of nurses, 80% of research staff, 92% of health information managers, and 68% of physical therapists, to name a few, are women. And as women physicians and scientists, we also need to understand and own whatever privilege we have, be it based on race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and particularly socioeconomic status. This truly needs to be a collective movement and one that does not leave anyone behind. It is through embracing diversity and fostering inclusion and following the data that we will focus on our next steps and move ourselves to impact. The Gender Equity Initiative here at the Larner College of Medicine is the result of hard work and vision by the Gender Equity Steering Committee and four gender equity working groups, as Dean Page mentioned. This diverse group of faculty and staff from across the institution are volunteers who feel truly passionate about realizing gender equity at Elcom. My heartfelt thanks go out to all of you for your thoughtfulness, hard work, and collaboration. Just a couple of notes about this presentation. We are recording this session and it will be available to view from the ODEI website under the video library tab in a few days. The program is available online and you can find the link in the chat. Also closed captioning is available and the link is in the chat as well. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Sarah Hawks. Dr. Hawks is a medical doctor with a degree in sociology and a PhD in epidemiology. She's the director of the Center for Gender and Global Health and a professor of global public health at University College London, where she leads research analyzing the use of evidence in policy processes, particularly in relation to gender and health and sexual health. She's lived and worked in much of the past 20 years in Asia, where she's gathered evidence, built capacity, and helped develop policy for programs focusing on gender, sexual health, and human rights. She works closely with national governments, research organizations, the WHO, and the United Nations Population Fund in Asia and the Middle East. I've followed Dr. Hawk's work for several years as she co-founded Global Health 5050, 
an independent evidence-driven initiative to advance action and accountability for gender equality in global health. The work of Global Health 5050 has been inspirational to me as I've thought about how to determine what gender equity looks like and how to use data to drive change. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Hawks with us today to speak about her work in a presentation titled Shining a Light on Gender Equality in the Health Sector, the Role of Global Health 5050 in Using Data for Advocacy. There will be time for questions at the end of Dr. Hawks' talk, and we'll use the Q&A function to ask questions, not the chat function. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Hawks to the virtual podium. Thank you very much, Dr. Doherty. And perhaps I could just start by um, sharing my screen. So let me start there and just get the slide up and running. And I hope everybody can see uh, the first slide, uh, which is always a good start if you can. Um, but first of all, let me start by giving you a huge thanks for the honor and the privilege to talk to you all um, during, you know, it's, it's easy to collapse the idea of equality down to one day. And, you know, we all have a bit of a tendency to, to do that and think that if we celebrate um, International Women's Day on March the 8th, then, then kind of that's that box ticked and we can forget about equality for the rest of the year. But I know that the people in the audience will join me in realizing that, that this is a, a lifelong struggle uh, for equality on, on a range of, of um, characteristics and attributes that we all have. And I'll come to that later in the talk. Um, and I am just really, really delighted to have the opportunity to, to talk to you about some of the work that we have been doing and I'm going to focus on the work in the, that I do as part of Global Health 5050, as Dr. Doherty says, to use data, rigorous evidence to promote um, advocacy, but also, and this is why I put it in capital letters, to hold us all to account for the promises and the commitments that all of us have made to um, seek a more equitable and just world for everybody, irrespective of their gender identity, of their racial identity, whether or not they have a disability, they're migrants, refugees, class, caste, any other characteristic, that we're all to be held to account for equality for all. So over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to present um, a little bit of an outline as to what we saw as the problem, the gender inequality of global health, how we came up with a politically informed solution. And I'm sorry, but given that I'm like, like all of you or like many of you um, on this, this call, I, I sit in an academic environment, so I, I couldn't help myself. I've had to include a bit of theory and a couple of frameworks in there and then think about how we move forward in both a theory-driven and uh, a politically aware way to achieve equality and equity for all. But I'm gonna start uh, um, just by telling you a little bit about my own journey towards what, what we do in Global Health 5050. So as, as you heard from Dr. Do Dr. Doherty, I am indeed um, a, a, a medic, um, a sociologist, an epidemiologist, a reflection on just how long you can spend in education when the state pays for it. It's, you know, you can keep going till you're in your mid thirties in my case. And after spending all of those years in college and <laughs> various research programs and projects around the world, I came to the conclusion that it was all very well me knowing how to do great science and how to do great research. But what I couldn't understand was why nobody was paying attention to all of the amazing papers I was putting out. Why weren't they listening to all of the evidence that I'd collected and why weren't they changing policy? So after 
many years of struggling to, to, to try and get to grips with the fact that nobody seemed to be listening to all of the bright ideas I had. I actually changed direction, not completely. I kind of went back to my roots as a, of my first degree, which was sociology, and sought to retrain in understanding the politics of global health and really um, retrained myself to be a policy analyst and a bit more of a political analyst, essentially to look at the politics of decision-making, to really try to figure out how decisions are made in terms of who benefits from the activities of the global health system and whose careers get advanced within the global health system. And perhaps more importantly, who doesn't benefit and whose careers don't advance. And so I do still, um, like all academics, get paid to, to do my day job, which is um, running research projects that look at the politics of decision making. But my focus is really on what role evidence around gender plays within the global health system. And as I said, how we hold the global health system to account for its commitments to gender and gender equality. And let me just say that the fantastically beautiful photographs that you will see throughout this talk are um, photographs that were submitted from all around the world as part of our global competition um, that we've held for the past few years, a, a global photographic competition called This Is Gender. And I'd strongly encourage you to, to visit our website and just explore those photos in detail. They've been curated by an expert um, art curator. You can read the histories of the photographers. You can read their views about what the photographs are saying. Um, but I, I've got the privilege of being able to just use some of the, 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 the amazing collection of photographs to really um, to, to illustrate this, this talk but also to get across one of the things that we were trying to um, address and redress when we first set up Global Health 5050, which I'll come to in a minute, but which was that the kind of the view of gender within global health was that we were talking about vulnerable women. And so if you looked at the, the, a, a lot of the imagery and a lot of the, the narratives about gender and global health, it was it very frequently used images of women in highly disempowered and vulnerable situations. Um, and so one of the reasons, one of the, the, the rationales for holding the, uh, for, for running the photography competition that we've been running is really to, to, to challenge that, to say that gender is about power and gender and being a woman is about the misdistribution of power in many settings. So on this slide, you'll see the various sort of gender related activities that, that I'm involved in. Um, I co-chair a Lancet Commission on Gender and Global Health, run the Center for Gender, Health and Social Justice and co-direct um, Global Health 5050. But what lies at the core of all of that is, is trying to unpick the relationship between gender and health and gender and career structures within the global health system. There will be as many definitions of what gender means as there are people on this call. And we can drive ourselves slightly round the twist, as we would say, certainly here in the UK, trying to get to grips with whether or not we all agree on what gender means. The, the, the position that we've taken as Global Health 5050 is that since we are essentially examining the global health system, that the, the, one of the benefits of the global, global health system is that it does have a normative agency sitting within it. In other words, it has the World Health Organization. And so we've used the definition used by the World Health Organization to really, uh, um, as, as the basis by which we assess the work of organizations that's, um, as to whether they are truly working on gender 
or whether they are, for exa example, working on social roles or sex defined health problems. We can certainly come back to questions of definitions, but I just want to put it up front right now that we work with this definition, which is that gender is a social construction. The definition is quite binary, but in our own work, we take a non-binary approach to the data that we collect. But one of the things that we find, uh, and you'll see this as I go through, is that there's really hardly any data out there beyond the binary, which we can, again, certainly come back to um, examining what that might mean for both health and careers. So with that introduction, let me start with what we saw as the problem. We started to we started Global Health 5050 really in some ways. I'm going to just skip forward a slide on the basis of this picture. I mean, this picture is not it's, it, it, it's not entirely fair to say that it was just on the basis of this picture. But to us, this picture exemplifies what we saw as a really deeply embedded problem within the global health system. So this is for those of you that, that have been to the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, you'll know that this is the India room sitting on the seventh floor. And here we have the great and the good of the global health system sitting around the table. And even if you're not a gender expert, you will immediately notice a level of inequity on the basis of gender that we thought was simply um, unsustainable, untenable, inequitable, and quite frankly, unfair. And on the basis of this and many other um, examples, we established GH5050 to really try and say, well, okay, we can all get angry when we see pictures like this, or many of us can get angry when we see pictures like this, but what is the problem? What, what is the extent of the problem? What's the evidence of the extent of the problem? And so what GH5050 does is it actually counts the, char the, the, the characteristics of the leadership of the global health system. It does more than that, and I'll, I'll come to that as I go through, but we do look in detail at who leads the system. And when I say the global health system, there's probably going to be as many visions of what I mean by the global health system as there are visions and definitions of gender amongst all of you. The global health system is multiple systems. It's highly complex. It's not one coordinated system. And so actually constructing a sampling frame of what we meant by the global health system was something that took us the best part of about 18 months. But essentially what we've, we've done is selected around 200 organizations that, that, that yield and wield power and have to be present in at least three countries and work in some way on health. And those organizations might be the, the normative agencies, the funding agencies, the philanthrocapitalists of health, the, the big funders such as the Wellcome Trust or the Gates Foundation, the multilateral system, some of the bilateral funders, the big international NGOs, the, the Médecins Sans Frontières or the Oxfams of the world, as well as the corporate sector that had stated an interest in influencing SD, Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is the health goal. So there's a lot to say about what the, the system is or isn't, but at the end of the day, we had to have a rationale for the organizations that we were looking at. And we've ended up with these 200 organizations. And when we look across the leadership of that, those 200 organizations, we find characteristics that show that 70% are men, 80% are nationals of high income countries, and over 90% are educated in high income countries. One statistic that I, I could draw on um, for the past couple of years is that there are more people leading the global health system educated in Harvard than in all universities in low and middle income countries combined. And we think that that's a problem. We think that that leads to stasis, to groupthink, to what 
in political science terms is called institutional path dependency because everybody's trained to think the same way. From the perspective of gender, we see that just 5% of the leadership of the global health system is represented by women from low and middle income countries. And again, we see this as a huge problem because we think in some ways following the, the, the terminology, the, the, um, the, the, the slogan for activism within the disability movement of nothing about us without us, we see that the people who are supposed to be benefiting from the activities of the system don't have a voice in the governance of the system. And again, we see that as a problem. Part of it is related to the history of, of post Second World War international relations, where global organizations are situated, where money lies, where power lies. It's still situated within the global north. It's still more likely in global, in much of the global health system, to be working in Geneva or New York than you are in Kigali or Kinshasa. And hence we, uh, again, you know, that, that then reflects back into who gets to lead the organizations sitting in high income countries. But it's not just the people at the very top. We see inequities all the way through. We look at senior management and we see that only a third of, of, of senior management, um, a third of organizations have achieved parity at the level of senior management and for the governing bodies. And it's the governing bodies that frequently really hold the power to direct the, 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 um, the work of the organizations, the priorities of the organization, how resources are spent, et cetera, that this, the situation within the governing bodies is even worse. So as Dr. Doherty has mentioned, you know, the, the, these situations don't arise just somehow randomly, um, they, they arise because organizations, employees, uh, employers rather, have not got the systems and structures in place to support equitable career structures. So this isn't just a case of trying to change the identity of the person at the top. This is about actually examining what goes on within the system the career system that allows everybody to have a fair chance at actually rising through the ranks. And so one of the things that we do every second year, because it's an enormous piece of work to do this, is we actually look at the policies that are in place across those 200 organisations. And one of the, the key um, areas that we, we look at is whether or not, for example, they report on gender pay gaps. Now, what we found over the years is that in the absence of a legal mandate, in other words, a government directive to report on gender pay gaps, organizations very rarely do. But we know that when organizations do report on gender pay gaps, it's incredibly motivating for women to actually st stand up and say, hold on, how comes we're not, we're, we're earning less than men are earning? So what you, I don't expect you to, to see, uh, to, to be able to interpret this slide, you can go onto our website and, and, um, and look at the details. But essentially what you see on this slide is that when it, whether, whether we're talking about take home pay or we're talking about who gets a bonus and the size of the bonus, there is a huge advantage accrued by men across the entire system. There's only a very small number of organizations where on average women are earning more than men are earning. One of the things that we have been um, slightly stunned by the couple of times that we've, we've done this calculation is that even when you get to the top of the tree, when you're right at the top of the ladder, you're still not earning as much as a woman than the men at the top of the tree uh, 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 compared to the men at the top of the tree. So one of the things that we're able to look at because you've got a really great um, transparent tax system in the US is that we're able to look at the tax returns of the big international non-governmental organizations that are headquartered in the United States. It's about 35 
organize, uh, 34 organizations, and we're able to look at how much their CEOs get paid. And what we find is that even controlling for the size of the organization, that women earn substantially less than men right at the top of the tree. And so women CEOs are paid on average across the board $45,000 a year less than their male counterparts. So this isn't just about gender inequality pay gaps throughout the system. It's about even if you get to the very top of the tree, you're not going to be paid as much. Sorry, seem to be stuck. OK, we, as I mentioned, we look at a whole range of other um, policies ac across organizations, um, including whether or not organizations have um, gender equality uh, policies, diversity and inclusion policies in the workforce. We map this year on year. And then we look, as, as Dr. Doherty has said, it's not just about whether your career can progress, it's about whether you have a safe and supportive working environment. So we look at the, um, the existence of sexual harassment policies, and we, we actually really drill down into those sexual harassment policies in order to see whether each policy conforms to one of four core gold standard characteristics of what a sexual harassment policy should look like. So you'll find all of these data points, all of these details for um, year after year um, on, on our website, on the, on the Global Health 5050 um, website. And finally, one of the things that we look at again in huge detail, and I certainly don't expect you to be able to, to read this slide, but you might be able to spot a pattern here, is we look at the issue of parental leave. Because one of the things that we're all acutely aware of is that the moment that women's careers essentially fall off the cliff edge is when they have a child. And some countries, uh, <laughs> and I'm talking to the major offender in, in this space right now, have taken the position that the way to, to deal with that is simply to get women back into the workforce as quickly as possible. In other words, not to support parents to stay at home with their children, but to, to get women back into the workforce quickly. And so you'll see what, what the bars represent is the length of parental leave. On the left-hand side, it's the length of parental leave for the primary caregiver, which is often the mother. On the right-hand side, it's the secondary caregiver, giver, which is generally the father. The ones right at the top with, with the shortest parental leave um, allowances are the American companies, the American NGOs, the American federally uh, funded organizations that are in our sample of 200. Down at the bottom, you've got more of the, the Canadians, the Scandinavians, the Japanese. And we can certainly come back to discussing what difference parental leave, but also equally importantly, childcare policies mean um, when it comes to ensuring that women have uh, women and other primary caregivers have um, an equal opportunity to keep their careers going, even in the face of parenthood. So those are the data points that, that, that we've collected. But as I say, we kind of had an inkling that we knew what some of the problem was even before we, we started collecting the data. So Dr. Doherty just asked me to reflect on kind of what it is that we did and why we did it. So what I've presented to you already is, is, is what we found, but, but I'm gonna take a moment of your time and apologize in advance for giving you a couple of theory slides to tell you about the underlying theory of, of why we do what we do. We understand that, that change doesn't happen um, randomly, that change happens, particularly change, if what we're seeking as, as, as communities of people, if we're seeking to change policy, for example, policy change doesn't happen just because we have a great piece of evidence. Policy, happen, policy change happens at the arrival of what's called a policy window. In other, we, in other words, we need to show that there's a problem, we need to show there's a solution, 
And we need to have the political support for change to happen. So we knew that in addition to being able to gather evidence and show what the size of the problem was, we needed also to be able to gather evidence to show that there are solutions out there. But we also needed to have a handle on the politics stream. We needed to understand what the politics of addressing gender inequality within the global health system actually looked like. I'm gonna skip over this, this slide and say that, that what really then informed what we, what we were up to was our understanding of what um, a, a political scientist called John Gaventa has described as the advocacy coalition framework, which essentially says you need to find, well, certainly you need to understand what, what policies are and how policies operate and the subsystems within which policies operate. But you also need to find like-minded allies. And those like-minded allies need to bring to the party a range of skills and disciplines and ideas. And the reason for that is that, again, coming, I'll go back to, to this slide, coming, coming back to the, the notion that evidence matters and data matters, we, we kind of understood all of that. But what we also understood from the, the, the theory of this slide, which is a slide by um, a political analyst called Peter John, is that Ideas are more than just empirical numbers. Ideas are about how we frame things, how we talk about things, about the values that societies and systems hold. And so if we want to change anything, it's not enough just to put the data out there. We have to be able to understand the environment and the institutions into which that data is being absorbed, the values of that institution, and really importantly, who stands to both gain and lose from the, the, the change that we are calling for. So these, are, I'll stop on the theory and say that those were the theoretical underpinnings of what we first started to do when we first put out a call to say, okay, we've got a great idea, we're gonna collect all this data, we need some help. And here's the first round of people who applied to work with us. And I've included this slide, partly as a reminder that if you say you wanna work on gender equality or anything to do with gender, it's women who turn up to the table. We had 60 applications in the first year, 59 of them were from young women. And we think that that's actually part of the problem. We think that when the call for changing gender inequality is only coming from the most disadvantaged people in the room, then we've got a problem. And so what we have strategically set out to do over the five years that we've been operating is to include more men. And so you'll see in this slide, which is our current makeup of, of, um, of people who work with us and collect all the incredible data that I've presented to you, is that we, we've been slightly successful in getting more men to the party. Um, but one of the things we've definitely been more successful at, at doing is reach is, is it achieving a more global reach. We've managed to now get um, researchers everywhere from Colombia to um, Zimbabwe. I'm going to come back to the politics stream because what mattered to us, as I said, was not just that we had good data and even that we had a good understanding of the, the values of gender equality or how we address equity. We really needed to ensure that our data reached the right political players. And so when we, when we established Global Health 5050, it was really important to us to have a politically informed and politically networked group of advisors. And so what you see on this slide is, for example, um, Helen Clark, the three times prime minister of New Zealand. You see um, Jan Beagle, who was head of management for the United Nations system. You see Sunait Fissaha, who is the, um, the, the senior advisor to Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization. You see Sanya Nishtar, who leads the, um, the, the, the social support 
program for the government of Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, just going back to our theory, we really understood that we needed to have people with political clout who could amplify our data, who could really take our messages and run with them in a way that we as the researchers, the people actually collecting the data, were unlikely to be able to do. I'll be really honest with you as well, we, we needed good alliteration. There's nothing so powerful in global health as, as words that run together alliteratively. So we inform, inspire and incite and various other combinations of, of alliterative terminology that you'll see running through our report. But what this is a reflection of is that if you actually were to look at our um, budgets and our tax returns, what you would see is that more than 50% of the money that we spend in terms of staff salaries is actually spent on communication specialists. That we realized if we truly wanted to get the rigorous data that we've collected out there into the world, we needed professional communication specialists um, to work with us. So we collect data across 10 parameters. You've seen those 10 parameters. Um, but once we've got the data, we need to address those values, those ideas, the framing of equality within the system. And so what you see here is that one, you know, we, we do this strategically. We don't just do this, this through sort of random um, publication of, of various data points. We actually have strategic planning by communications companies as to how we will get our message out there. Who is it we're trying to reach? Not just a list of stakeholders, but what's their power and their position within the global health system? How are we going to frame our message? Our message up till now has been very positive framing. In other words, we try and give organizations a pat on the back and say, God, it's really fantastic that you've managed to increase your um, or decrease your gender pay gap by 2% over the past year, you know, you're going to get a green tick from us. So we've been very encouraging and positive in our in our framing so far, really heavy use of social media, and then very strong um, engagement methods, including the, uh, the, the, the photography competition that I, I told you about as well as other forms of public engagement across the board. But at the end of the day, down the, the center there is supposed to be a bunch of dollar signs to remind you that getting to equality costs money. It, it, you know, we, we can have calls for equality. We can have commitments to diversity and inclusion but we have very clearly learned that it doesn't happen through a process of evolution. It needs to be a strategically managed change and it needs to be properly resourced. It needs commitments both in terms of human resources and really importantly, in terms of financial resources to actually support all of these, these great ideas that we have in terms of how to get the message out there. So these are the kinds of, of um, outputs that we've managed to, to have over the past five years. We have an annual report, we have an index, we have tons of media outreach, we have the, um, the, the This Is Gender Photography competition, this, this, tell, this is the, the, um, the, co the front cover of last year's report. Right now we're right in the midst of pulling together the final data points for, um, for the 2022 report. We produce this annual index where you can look at the 200 organizations in detail across all of those parameters that I showed you on one of the slides that I went through really quickly. Apologies about that, but you, again, you can go in detail on our, on our website and look at how these organizations are performing year on year. Who is the CEO? How are they doing on their sexual harassment policies? How were they doing last year compared to this year, et cetera? And then the final slide is just to give you an inkling of, of um, how we see ourselves moving forward. Moving forward, you know, we, we're people who've spent our lifetimes working at the level of the, 
of the governance of the global health system, trying to understand how this multilateral system works for the well-being of people's health and careers. But one of the things we really truly understand is that health is a, is a nationally owned asset to society and as is gender equality, a nationally owned asset. And so one of the things that we've been pushing for and have recently uh, been doing is actually taking the, the global health 50-50 method, methodology and rolling it out at, at country level. And we'll be producing our, or our partners will be producing their first report from Nepal um, in a couple of months time. This isn't something that is unique to the, to the health sector. We're now working with the food sector. We hope that we can also have partnerships with the climate sector. And we think that, that all sectors should be able to do this kind of work and advocate for change on the basis of data um, and systems of accountability. We're doing research, in-depth research over the coming um, year in both India and Kenya to actually analyze how on the ground organizations have systems of um, equality of career opportunity in place. And finally, I think the one thing that we, the one conclusion that we've come to as we prepare our 2022 report is enough of the nice girl position. There are a whole bunch of organizations in our sample, and you'll be able to see them when the report comes out and the index comes out, that have not moved at all over the five years we've been monitoring them. So we have up till now focused on praising the organizations that are doing well, but from this year's report, we are not quite going to name and shame, but we are going to allow you to be able to pinpoint the organizations that the students amongst you would not really want to go and work for if you are concerned about having an equitable opportunity for career advancement as your career in global health progresses over your lifetime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawks. I appreciate you sharing um, all of your wisdom and experience as a champion of gender equity um, and, and that sense of using data to drive policy change. And um, I, I want to let folks know that you can use the Q&A function to submit questions. We do have some time um, to, to take questions. Um, I, I do have one um, thought myself, which is, and we talk a lot about um, who's in the room when we're talking about gender equity, and oftentimes it's women, um, and women are the majority of people who are in this room right now. And not that we don't have some really tremendous male allies, but how do you think about engaging men and it just engaging the whole community in the, the struggle and the fight for advancing gender equity. Thanks, Anne. Um, so I'll tell you what we've seen across the sector. So what, we, what we've seen across the sector is that for those organizations within um, the health community that have a mandate and a set of principles, that are really dedicated to social justice, that those organizations say, well, we have to have equality because it's all about human rights and it's the right thing to do and everybody needs a fair chance. And um, gender equality is one representation of a fair chance in, you know, in the way that um, many other intersectional characteristics are representing a fair chance. So if you look at the, you know, how the big NGOs or how the multilateral system frame equality, it is on the basis of rights, fairness, justice. If you look at the private sector, they say it's because it's more efficient. The more diversity you have in the, in the C-suite, the more efficient our organization is because we better understand the market, we improve our shareholder value, we can reach more customers, more we can sell more whatever they're selling. So there are different narratives 
as to why equality matters that seem from our bird's eye view to depend on which part of the sector we're talking about. So it, I think it's really hard to say that there's one right narrative, but I think I, I think it really does come back to the to the, that issue of, of ideas, of framing, that how we frame things. And I, I mean, what strikes me, we, we've, as part of the Lancet Commission, we've spent a long time looking at, at the language that has been used to talk about gender within the health community um, for about the past 60 years. And first of all, <laughs> Spoiler alert, the, the health community has actually only been talking about gender in a substantive way since the 1990s. Okay, so the, the word gender doesn't appear in global health before 1992. But when it does start talking about gender, it frames it as some uh, as this notion of of poor, vulnerable women who need to, to have men engaged in order to help women. What we never really see is that gender equality benefits everybody. We never see people pushing the small amount of powerful evidence to show that, that gender transformative change improves health outcomes for men and women and across the, the, the gender identity spectrum. That this is not something about, I mean, it is about women claiming the spaces to which they are entitled, but it's also about something that, that has benefits across all of society. The benefits are not only accrued by people who identify as women. And I, I think, in, in the US, we, we see um, a fair amount of all or none thinking. It's a zero sum game. So if someone gains, then someone else loses. And I think what you're saying is poignant. That's not the fact. We all, we all grow together and we all improve together. Thank you. Um, we do have several questions. Two of them are, are around um, medical schools, medical education, and um, the double AMC, which is our um, accrediting um, or our professional organization for uh, American medical colleges. So Dr. Leonard says, I noted that um, double AMC has among the worst maternal and paternal leave policies. How can we drive change with this leading US academic medicine organization? And Dr. Bonnie um, also follows up with, when will we do this for medical schools? Yeah, the, it, I mean, it is really fascinating to me that for such for for a country that is so progressive that you in in so many realms and you know, <laughs> despite the, the 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 peaks and troughs of of American politics, <laughs> that you know you've generally been amongst some of the more, most one of the most progressive countries globally, but. I do find it, I'll have to be really candid with you, I find it astonishing that you haven't all claimed your rights as parents in a way that we have done across the European Union. Well, I'm no longer in the European Union, but for, for example, when we were in the European Union, across the whole of Europe, we have managed to see this as absolutely fundamental to equality, that in the absence of support, not just for the, for the immediate um, uh, uh, postnatal period of three months, six months, one year, two years in the case of some um, European countries, but throughout the lifetime of the, the process of social reproduction, i.e. bringing up a family, that the state has a role to play in that. You know, at the end of the day, I, I, what, what we see is a real hit and miss patchwork of responses across American organizations, depending on the largesse of the people at the top of the organization, in the absence of government regulation that says you need to support the production of the next generation, as well as supporting everybody to have an equal opportunity in careers. Now, you know, I would argue, and this is very much the philosophy of GH5050, 
that we can't just wait for the people at the top to kind of dole out um, discretionary uh, equality moves, that it's actually up to the people within the system to demand change. And so it's up to the women in the system and the fathers in the system, really importantly, to say, I, you know, I, I want to exert my rights to look after my children. I think that's exactly right. Um, Dr. Berger asks a, a broader question. Um, to implement gender equity at the national level, which, if anything, needs to come first? engagement at the corporate level to start a new culture that can be leveraged into political policy or national policy that dictates policy within companies and, and organizations. So which, which comes first? Is it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> so it's a really good question. It's a really, really good question. And, and what we've seen is that the corporate sector, if the question is about what, what what, what motivates the corporate sector to, to work on gender equality and the influence that that has on national policy. We've certainly seen that what, what is motivating the corporate sector, the for-profit sector, to be working on issues of, of um, social responsibility of which gender equality is, is a part, um, we, we think seems to be motivated by a couple of uh, issues. One is literally shareholder value, that shareholders are demanding social responsibility for, from the corporate sector. The other, and I think this, this comes back to my previous point about the power of employees, is that the, we see a race to the top in how the, the corporate sector frames its gender equality policies within the workplace. It wants to attract the brightest and the best. And one way to attract the brightest and the best women is to offer them the most equitable, supportive policies for career advancement, including parental leave and childcare support, et cetera, et cetera. So we see that as a real virtuous circle that seems to be happening within parts of the corporate sector that could certainly be mirrored within other parts of the system, you know, that would certainly be matched within within other parts of the system. That the employee, you know, once you once you actually frame this as a way of attracting good women into the into the system and keeping them there, then it motivates change um, in in the policy environment. We haven't seen much in terms of how that then. Uh, diffuses across to the national level that 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 doesn't seem to be um, as well recorded thank you i think we have time for one other uh brief question we do have more questions we just won't be able to get to all of them um but the question is about the naming and shaming the institutions that mm -hmm. um that haven't um, made any change with the knowledge that you've already shared with them do you worry that they could become uh, defensive or or more um, strongly sort of seated in their position. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> I mean, to, to some extent, one could argue, well, it can't get any worse because they haven't changed. And what what we do what we do see is that these are also the organisations that tend not to engage with us. Because one of the things that I I, I should have mentioned is that we stick to, when we established GH fifty fifty we read a lot of the human rights literature in order to develop our understanding of what accountability means. And we, we found three core principles of, of an accountability system. One is independence, transparency, and the ability to have sanctions. We don't have the ability to have sanctions. Naming and shaming would be our first sort of dipping the toe into that water. We are fully transparent and you only get a green mark if we find your policies online, because we, you know, we think that that's the only way that young people coming into the system can assess you. 
but we are truly independent. We have absolute independence from all of those 200 organizations. Um, and so, you know, they, 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 there's not, we're not rely, unlike other sort of charter mark systems, we don't rely on those organizations paying us to produce that index. And so we think that that's probably our, um, our, our one foil against uh, uh, against pushback is that we're we're financially independent from them. I hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for for sharing all of this with us today. And um, I will say that, um, as I said in the beginning, I've used Global Health fifty fifty, and our Gender Equity Steering Committee has actually put together a gender equity report card for academic medicine that's very much modeled on Global Health fifty fifty, and that we're getting ready to pilot. So, thank you for your pioneering uh, work and ideas. And also, I do love the theories of change. So, please keep talking about them. So interesting. <laughs> Um, I would welcome you, um, Dr. Hawks, to stay for the remainder portion of our presentation today. So we're going to move on now to our awards ceremony. Um, the bestowing of awards serves multiple purposes in academic medicine. It calls out the achievements and the contributions of individuals, but it also broadcasts the individual's presence to a wider audience and is a signifier of regional, national, an international reputation of the individuals. Um, the nominations uh, that we received for the Gender Equity Awards this year were truly outstanding and they all of them are listed in the program. Even being nominated for one of these awards is truly an achievement and a recognition. Um, this is just a testament to the talent and commitment we have at our college. Ultimately, a slate of finalists was uh, created and these were reviewed with Dr. or excuse me, Dean Page and Associate Dean Margaret Tando. And the awards um, were finally decided. Um, Dr. Leanne Holterman, who's a member of the Gender Equity Steering Committee and co-chair of our Education and Professional Development Working Group and Assistant Professor of uh, Psychiatry, we will present this year's awards along with Dean Rick Page. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Our first award presentation today is the Gender Equity Champion Award. Equity and inclusion are inextricably linked to the UVM Larner College of Medicine's mission of education, research, and patient care. In recognition of that mission, many college faculty, staff, students, and trainees are actively engaged in championing equity and inclusion in multiple local, regional, and global settings. This award recognizes Larner College of Medicine community members, including faculty, staff, and students who have demonstrated outstanding commitment and service to the advancement of women and gender minorities beyond the scope of their job, area of research, or training. This year, due to exceptional nominations, a faculty and a student award are being bestowed. Now to present the award to each of the recipients, here's Dean Page. Thank you very much, Dr. Holterman. And, and before I proceed, I do wanna acknowledge uh, Dr. Hawk's wonderful talk and, and our gratitude for your spending time with us today. Our first recipient today is Dr. Eli Goldberg. As a member of, of the Larner College of Medicine as a student, and now a current resident physician in family medicine. Dr. Goldberg has been a tireless advocate and educator for LGBTQ plus and transgender care. While a medical student, his Schweitzer Fellowship focused on Transform Project, as it was called, a collaboration with the Pride Center of Vermont for which he developed a statewide transgender peer mentoring network. As a resident, Dr. Goldberg maintains his focus on trans health as he co-leads a statewide task force aimed at expanding adult gender affirming care throughout the region. Dr. Goldberg, along with Dr. Doherty, developed creating a transgender inclusive environment, a training program for clinical staff, including schedulers, medical assistants, and nurses that has been delivered in several clinical sites across UVM Health Network. This project was also presented nationally. 
Dr. Goldberg developed a didactic series on gender affirming care for the family medicine residency, and he helped operationalize an asynchronous model of resident precepting for gender affirming care at Milton Family Practice. This initiative expanded much needed gender affirming care services across the North Country. Dr. Goldberg was nominated by the entire Department of Family Medicine. Please join me in um, acknowledging and congratulating Dr. Eli Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly honored and even more so because so many of the other nominees and awardees have been role models for me um, as a student and as a resident. The, the words that jumped out at to me when you were reading the description of the award were beyond the scope of their job, which I thought was funny because really my interest in trans health is the thing that led me to this job in the first place. And so in that sense, it feels like it's at the core of what I do. Um, and when I applied to med school, I had never met an openly trans doctor. And I was told by several people that if I wanted to get into med school, that I should not be out as trans and should not make that part of my, my mission. But I couldn't understand how we could get to health equity for trans folks unless trans folks were visible and present at the table as colleagues. Um, and of course, that's true, not just for trans folks, but for anyone who's been marginalized in healthcare. Um, and so I feel incredibly fortunate to have landed here at UVM because this is an institution where equity is at the core of what we do and where people really recognize that all of us are stronger when we can all bring our lived experiences to the table and when we all have equitable opportunities in the workplace and access to affirming healthcare. And I also feel very fortunate that people at UVM believe that an idealistic med student or a very tired resident can still be a meaningful voice for change. And so many people have supported me in learning how to, to be an advocate um, and helping me to accomplish um, what, what I've hoped to work for. So I'm incredibly grateful and I'm, I'm really excited to keep doing this work with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those inspiring words. The second Gender Equity Champion Award for 2022 goes to Ms. Montana K. Lara. Montana K. Lara, a PhD candidate or future doctor in the, de the Department of Neurological Sciences, is an unrelenting champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion at, Larner and the, at UVM and the Larner College of Medicine. The only student representative to serve as a commissioner on the UVM President's Commission for Inclusive Excellence, she co-founded and serves as secretary of the UVM chapter of the Association for Women in Science, which provides a place for women scientists to find community and support. She is active on the Department of Neurological Sciences DEI committee and served on the search committee for the UVM Vice Provost for DEI. Currently, she's working on the Davis Center's exhibit committee to guarantee their offerings promote the advancement of underrepresented identities. Finally, she's a founder of the Vermont chapter of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, which has a mission statement that parallels Dr. Monta future Dr. Montana's approach to equity and inclusion. And to quote them, that there is a place for you in STEM where you can show up exactly as you are, where your identities are affirmed as your strength, your roots are nourished, are nurtured, not dismissed, and where diversity, equity, and inclusion are the priority, not an assimilation to the majority. Please join me in congratulating future Dr. Montana K. Lara. Thank you so much. I am so incredibly grateful and honored to be here with this wonderful group of people. Um, I wanted to just first acknowledge my parents, Lorraine and Tony, my brothers and my partner, who constantly meet me with an open heart when I have really strong ideas for advocacy that often include action on their part. Um, I really appreciate all the work that has been done thus far, especially by all of these individuals being recognized here. Um, and I just also wanna recognize that gender equity necessarily intersects 
a multitude of other identities beyond gender, especially those identities that are underrepresented in science and medicine, including the racial global majority. So in accepting this award, um, I also just wanted to challenge our institution to, quote, drop the nice girl position, as Dr. Hawks put it, be an institution that Dr. Hawks would praise for our systems of accountability and gender transformative change to be radical in creating a truly just and equitable environment for science and medicine to flourish. I'm so hopeful for our institution and I just wanna thank you for this award. Um, and I really hope to see the ideas presented here in action at UVM. So thank you so much. Congratulations to you both. The next award is the Gender Equity Outstanding Achievement in Medicine and Science Award. This award is given to a woman or gender minority faculty member within the Larner College of Medicine who has demonstrated outstanding achievement in medicine and science through research, education, or service. Additionally, this individual must be recognized at a national and or international level for their scientific or medical achievements and serve as a role model to women or gender minority community members at the Larner College of Medicine. Finally, awardees will have demonstrated a commitment to advancing equity and inclusion for women and gender minority community members. Dean Page will tell us more about this year's recipient. Thank you, Dr. Holterman. The 2022 Gender Equity Outstanding Achievement in Medicine and Science Award goes to Dr. Beth Kirkpatrick. Dr. Kirkpatrick's scholarship is truly outstanding with impact felt globally, particularly in low resources areas. Through the Vaccine Testing Center, she directs a multidisciplinary team dedicated to decreasing the burden of infectious diseases globally through the study and development of vaccines. In addition to the performance of phase one to three clinical trials and human experimental infection models, her research works to advance understanding of the human immune response to infections and vaccines. She has numerous publications and grants and is an invited reviewer for the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the NIH, to name a few. We at UVM are especially thankful to Dr. Kirkpatrick and her team for their leadership through the COVID-19 pandemic. Beyond her scholarship, Dr. Kirkpatrick has championed the advancement of staff and faculty guided by a deep belief in gender equity and professionalism in her roles as director of the Vaccine Testing Center, chair of the Microbiology and Medical Genetics Department, uh, Department and principal investigator of the Translational Infectious Diseases Research Center. In 2018, UNESCO reported that more than 30% of the world's researchers are women. Dr. Kirkpatrick's nominator states, and I quote, when I joined the Vaccine Testing Center in 2013, it was about 75% female and still is, which is way ahead of the curve in the field. Another nomination stated, and I quote again, Dr. Kirkpatrick assured that exceptionally competent women had the opportunity to fill leadership roles in the high intensity and very visible COVID-19 vaccine trial. Dr. Kirkpatrick truly strives to make sure that any environment in which she works is free of bias and discrimination and that professionalism is paramount. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Beth Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dean Page. And I really want to also thank um, Dr. Holterman, Dr. Dougherty, um, and Dean Tando, as well as the whole Gender Equity uh, Steering Committee. I'm really humbled, um, really honored, humbled to re receive this award. And it really, the nomination means a lot. I was nominated for, by Dr. Sean Deal. Um, and thank you very much, Sean. It um, really means a lot. The nomination means a lot. Um, I don't have much to say except a, really a lot of thank yous. And I think this, this award celebrates achievements in science and medicine. And I, I always say, like, it's generally not me doing the work. <laughs> and, and I think I... Um, I have to start by really thanking the overwhelming support I've received at both institutions and particularly in this forum. I think it's important to say that I've always felt that my support has been gender agnostic. Um, and that's saying a lot actually. Um, 
really just a tremendous amount of support from the medical center, the university and the college of medicine throughout my career. And I do wanna extend a special thanks to the faculty and staff of our research team, particularly the vaccine testing center and the tiger cobra and the department of MMG. And really any research honor should have the names of all of these people on it. And as was mentioned, we do have a fantastic and inspiring group of faculty, administrators, and staff, many of whom probably 80% are women, not intentionally, um, or maybe they were intentionally. It's a little hard to know, but we, we um, are very um, proud of, of all of the individuals in our group, and particularly we're very proud of how accomplished many of the women are and will become. Um, I, I want to also, I think I'd be remiss in thanking the Department of Medicine for their many supports in my career before I moved to this department, as well as the Division of Infectious Diseases. And I want to just also say for 24-7 support, persistence, and sense of humor, I'd be remiss without thanking my husband, John, and my two daughters, Elena and Olivia. And thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Kirkpatrick. We will now present the Polaris Award for Outstanding Mentorship. Polaris, or the North Star, is anchored at due north while the remainder of the northern sky rotates around it and serves as a beacon and directional point for those finding their way on a journey. The Polaris Award honors a Larner College of Medicine faculty or staff member who provides outstanding formal or informal mentorship for the Larner College of Medicine women and or gender, mi gender minority community members. Dean Page, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Holterman. The 2021 Polaris Award goes to Dr. Isabel Desjardins. Dr. Desjardins received two separate nominations from women faculty attesting to her outstanding skill and commitment to mentorship. As Chief Medical Officer of UVM Medical Center, Dr. Desjardins has led us through the Fannie Allen shutdown, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a cyber attack on top of that with grace authenticity, transparency, and humor. She's the kind of leader that the hospital staff view as a colleague, someone who is in it with you. One nominator relates, and I quote, when our operating room structure faced the successive challenges of COVID, the cyber attack, and the closure of the Fannie Allen operating rooms, she met with me bi-weekly to help us attain our goals of change within the operative environment. She engaged with me to better understand operational processes within the system with an aim at improving patient throughput, access, and experience. Another nominator stated, the past several years have tested all of us. For me, being early in my leadership roles, I had so much to learn and found Dr. Desjardins' vision, coaching, and focus on what is important helped me be more effective in supporting my teams during these turbulent times. She set up regular check-ins as well as team retreats and truly individualized her mentorship and was respectful of our diverse backgrounds, experiences, and needs in our different roles. Her high ethical standards are clear, accessible, well-communicated, and provide that guiding light that we needed when things were difficult and changing so quickly. The nomination goes on further. As I continue to learn and grow in my own journey, I value the mentorship, access, and support that Dr. Desjardins has shared with me. She's listened, questioned, and reflected with me on challenges that I've faced and offered honest and supportive advice that I know will continue to help me to grow personally and become a more effective leader and mentor to others in the future. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Desjardins, who unfortunately was not able to join us in person today, but was kind enough to leave a video that we'll now uh, present for you. Good afternoon. First, this event means more to me than you probably realize, and I'm really sorry not to be here in person. I tried really hard, and this is the closest I can ever be to be in two places at once. First, thank you to all of you working in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Please rest assured that you advance the conversations, the influence, the movement in ways that go beyond what you can imagine. 
I also want to congratulate all the nominees and awardees today. You make a difference and you are a source of inspiration for all of us. Finally, thank you for taking the time to nominate me and for the recognition. These past few years have been uncertain and challenging in many ways, and the time spent mentoring, modeling, and influencing how to lead has been both anchoring and inspiring to me. You have to know that the efforts that we refer to as mentoring are always mutually beneficial exercises. I use it to reinforce priorities, drive my own leadership reflection, and to make essential connections. That two-way learning energizes me every single time. So thank you for that. We have a lot of work to do to advance the DEI agenda. I encourage all of you to engage in the mentor-mentee conversations and that really special work. Um, let's not be shy. Let's make it concrete. Let's show the path. Let's lead in. And let's reinforce the need for diverse representation on finance committees, governing boards, prominent study sections, and in leadership positions that hold power and authority. That is the path to transformation. Let's do it together. Thank you for this recognition. I will carry it forward. And let's keep our eye on Polaris, our true north. Congratulations to Dr. Desjardins. The penultimate award of the, or of the day is the Rising Star Award. This award recognizes a woman or gender minority faculty or staff member at the Larner College of Medicine who is in the early stage of their career and who demonstrates excellence and contributions to students, colleagues, and or the institution in the areas of gender equity and inclusion through service, program development, teaching, research, or beyond. The awardee also shows the promise for future contributions and leadership in their field, as well as in achieving goals for the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Back to you, Dean Page, for this award presentation. Thank you, Dr. Holderman. The 2022 Rising Star Award goes to Dr. Joanna Conant. Dr. Conant was nominated by multiple faculty colleagues who appreciate and admire her dedication to gender equity. Dr. Conan is a Larner College of Medicine alum and completed her pathology residency training here at UVM Medical Center. She then went on to fellowships in molecular genetics and hematopathology pathology before returning as an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Larner College of Medicine in 2019. Within her first few months as a pathology attending, Dr. Conant sought out opportunities to participate in gender equity events. Her enthusiasm eventually resulted in her being recruited to the Gender Equity Steering Committee. And since 2019, she has co-chaired the Gender Equity Education and Professional Development Working Group, in which she designs, among other things, the Gender Equity Education Series, the hallmark of LCOM's Gender Equity Initiative. Dr. Conant is passionate about making LCOM a safe, just, and equitable place to work. In the late spring and early summer of 2020, when an examination of sexual harassment and misconduct became a high priority, Dr. Conant collaborated with professionals and experts in the, in the field from UVM Medical Center, the Larner College of Medicine, UVM Main Campus, and the local community to design a thoughtful, thought-provoking, sensitive, an informative three session series on that topic. These sessions were well attended and served as a grounding point for many in our institution. One nominator commented, and I quote here, Dr. Conant is truly dedicated to the advancement of gender equity at LCOM. She's currently honing her skills as an organizer and leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. It's truly a pleasure to have a colleague such as Dr. Conant by my side in doing this work. She's reliable, responsive, innovative, and passionate. I have no doubt, given her initial tenure at LCOM, that she will continue to grow as a thought and action leader at our institution. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Joanne Conan. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Page, Dr. Holterman, 
uh, Dr. Doherty, the entire ODEI staff, those who, nominated, those who nominated me in the selection committee. Dr. Hawks, thank you for being with us today to provide your perspective through such an insightful and thought-provoking talk. Um, it's an absolute honor to share this virtual space with the other awardees and my fellow nominees. Congratulations to each and every one of you. The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg once wrote, as women, and I would add gender minorities, achieve power, the barriers will fall. As society sees what women can do, as women see what women can do, there will be more women out there doing things and we'll all be better off for it. We've come together to celebrate today to acknowledge the work that so many are doing for gender equity and to fuel this passion in others. I don't have time or space to thank everyone, but I do have a few key individuals that I need to acknowledge, those who have played pivotal roles in my work towards gender equity and representation. First and foremost, Dr. Ann Doherty. I still remember that first gender equity town hall. It occurred just weeks after I started here as faculty in 2019, and I left that session inspired and invigorated and I'm incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work with you ever since. Your steadfast, thoughtful, and committed work as Director for Gender Equity is truly inspirational. Deborah, Dr. Deborah Leonard, my chair in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, thank you for making DEI work a priority within our department and in fostering an environment that allows women and underrepresented minorities to not only survive, but to thrive, even in the midst of all we've been through the past few years. We truly have paved the way and we are all better off for it. Dr. Pam Gibson, a colleague, mentor, and confidant. Your work as chair of the Pathology and Laboratory Medicine's DEI Committee to strengthen equity and social justice is truly inspiring, as is the impact you've had not just within our department, but across the health network and at the university. Finally, I would like to take a moment to thank my mother, Diana Lin, who immigrated here from Taiwan. As a computer engineer started, who started in the 1970s, she frequently found herself alone amongst a building full of men, incessantly working, working to prove herself and to break down barriers. First toward having others acknowledge that she, a woman, was a capable engineer, and then eventually moving up into leadership positions. She then started her own control system integration company, and later this spring, we'll be celebrating 30 years since starting that company. Thank you, mom, for showing me at an early age what we are all capable of. Putting together the Gender Equity Education Series has been one of the most invigorating and rewarding aspects of being back at UVM. And I cannot end without acknowledging the members of the Gender, Gender Equity Education Working Group. Current co-chair, Dr. Leanne Holterman, former co-chair, Katie Huggett, committee members, Dr. Molly Berry, Dr. Eileen Sychowski kelly and Dr. Jen Hall. I get to have monthly lively discussions with each and every one of these individuals, brainstorming topics and speakers. I hope that you all have found the content of the Gender Equity Education Series thought provoking. And we all look forward to providing more space for learning, reflection and interaction in the future. As we've been reminded today, we have much work to do in achieving gender equity, but we have much to celebrate as well. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Conan, and it really is an honor to serve with you as co-chair. Uh, so our final award of the afternoon is the Gender Equity Lifetime Achievement Award. This is the inaugural presentation of this important award. University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine Gender Equity Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes an individual who has demonstrated a career-long commitment to promoting gender equity at the Larner College of Medicine and beyond. The honoree demonstrates transformational leadership in medicine and science through their professional focus on gender equity, their track record of effective mentorship for women and gender minorities, and their longstanding service in the recruitment, retention, and promotion of women and gender minorities. Back to you, Dean Page, for our last award recipient. Thank you, Dr. Holterman. And before I make this last announcement, I just have to reflect on how proud I am to be a member of this organization and how grateful I am to the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and the Gender Equity Working Groups. Um, hearing the stories and looking at the people on the screen today provides me great optimism for us to achieve the gender equity that we're all aspiring to accomplish here at our college and beyond. So I wanna thank everybody for what they've done and now just pivot to our last awardee, 
the 2022 Gender Equity Lifetime Achievement Award that goes to Dr. Paula Tracy. Dr. Tracy has had a long career dedicated to teaching and mentoring in many arenas and demonstrates outstanding achievement in medicine and science through research, education, and service, and particularly a commitment to gender equity. After earning her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Hobart and William Smith Colleges and her PhD in biochemistry from Syracuse University, Dr. Tracy completed postdoctoral training in the Special Coagulation Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. After serving as an assistant professor of pathology at the University of Rochester, she joined the UVM faculty as a research assistant professor of medicine and biochemistry in 1984, rising to the rank of professor in 1997. She has served in many leadership roles within the College of Medicine, including interim chair of biochemistry, course director for NMGI, and director of foundations most recently from 2012 to 2018. Dr. Tracy is also a founding contributor to the Vermont Integrated Curriculum, or VIC. She's inspired numerous undergraduate, graduate, and medical students over her career, individually mentoring over 100 trainees. In addition, Dr. Tracy was a longstanding faculty member for the UVM American Medical Women's Association, or AMWA chapter, and often would host the famous Cookie Swap networking event. Dr. Tracy's advocacy for women in medicine and science starts with middle and high school girls with the long running Science and Health, a Discovery Day for Girls that's been running continuously since 2001. In addition, in order to support those who are underrepresented in medicine, Dr. Tracy has played an instrumental role in the Larner College of Medicine Summer Medicine Medical School Prep Program and the Jumpstart VIC curriculum from 2019 to the present, designed specifically for non-science majors and non-traditional students matriculating to medical school. In 2005, she received the Gender Equity Award from the UVM AMWA chapter. And in 2017, she received the Distinguished Career Award from the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. It is difficult for anyone here in our Larner College of Medicine to imagine this place without Dr. Tracy, but she plans to retire in 2022. She has left an indelible mark on UVM's Larner College of Medicine, and we can think of no better honoree for the inaugural Gender Equity Lifetime Achievement Award. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Paula Tracy. Thank you, Dean Page. Uh, thank you, everyone who's uh, still with us um, all. So uh, let's see, where do I want to start? I want to start with the fact that I couldn't have done all the things that I've done if I wasn't here at uh, Larner College of Medicine and the University of Vermont. And I say that because when I first came in, uh, as you mentioned, in 1984, almost January of 85. Uh, my husband and I started our research programs and um, had wonderful opportunities through the university when they were hosting programs like the MARC program, Minority Access to Research Careers. There was the RAP program, the Research Apprentice uh, Project. We had a pipeline program with Delaware State um, College and um, it was truly inspiring and wonderful to work with such amazing young women. And so certainly kept me going as far as all of that is concerned um, and helped me to appreciate, frankly, that I could make a difference. And that was really important to me. And um, the other thing that um, I have to say is that I've had amazing colleagues to work with um, who have supported me. We are like-minded. We pull the wagon in the same direction. Um, I have had wonderful students. If anybody knows me well, they know that for me, it's always all about the students. And uh, my role in that regard is to 
serve them the best way that I can, depending upon what their goal is, and to be their strongest advocate, because everybody needs a strong advocate. And, um, and I've been extremely lucky that I have had lots of strong advocates. Um, it's really nice for me to be in this same um, specter, I guess, um, with Dr. Doherty, um, Dr. Conant, and Dr. Goldberg, since I taught all of them. So now you know that this truly is a lifetime, um, but I've never viewed it as a lifetime because it has been an incredible amount of fun. And um, I have, I am so honored by this award. It's um, quite remarkable. I have to say that uh, when I got the uh, email from Dr. Daugherty, um, it was a Friday afternoon. I'm not, if anybody knows me, they know that I'm not very good with my email. And I thought, okay, it's Friday. I better check my email. And my immediate response to um, her email was, I was just stunned. And I had, I had no idea that I was even being considered for such an award. And I guess mainly because I just always configured this to be part of my job, that that's what you do when you take care of students. And um, the driving force for me, and then I'll I'll be done is that um, when I started graduate school way back in 1972, Syracuse University took in 20 um, starting students and there were only two women, Carol Gibson and myself. And we sort of looked at each other and said, we know there are better women out there. So we were quite stunned by that, tried to change things a bit. It was pretty hard. Um, the department was had one female in it, one woman, um, and she didn't get tenure, which was very disappointing. So my entire department was all male. My laboratory, with, my, with the exception of me, was all male. And then when I went to um, my postdoc in Rochester, Minnesota, I was the first female hired in a postdoctoral, in a lab that had six other male postdocs. So the good news is I never really felt marginalized. I always felt that I honestly could hold my own. And um, that's what I tried to, that's what I tried to inspire in all of the students who trained in my lab and got their PhDs with me. And um, since several of them uh, left and then came back to UVM and they're just carrying on the great tradition of um, mentoring and teaching and um, providing encouragement, which I think is our job, um, to um, our students. It's uh, just a total pleasure for me to still be here and um, see the accomplishments that they've made and the contributions to our school that they're making. And so I just want everybody to know that um, I've, I've loved it here. I love it here still at UVM. And uh, I can't think of a better it, this is the most meaningful award I have ever received. And so I thank you for that. And um, I will hopefully continue to carry it forward. And uh, we'll see if I do that. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. I'm so thrilled that we can honor you in this way. And you've been a mentor to me for many, many years. Um, and I hope you don't go too far away in your retirement. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for our celebration of gender equity in medicine and science. Some special uh, shout outs uh, to Amanda, our closed uh, captioner, to uh, Bruce and Jason and the COMAV team for being superheroes. Uh, Tammy Candido, our administrative uh, uh, coordinator in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Tiffany Delaney, our director. Margaret Tando, um, our associate dean, and the rest of our ODEI staff. Our gender equity steering committee, the working groups. Um, you all mean so much to me, and uh, and it's it's all of our collective work that gets an event like this off the ground. 
Congratulations to our amazing award recipients and nominees. I am so deeply honored to be part of this community. And I just continue to marvel and be impressed by the energy and commitment to gender equity at the Learner College of Medicine. And that comes from all of you. So as uh, uh, the late John Lewis said, let's keep making good trouble, good trouble and continue to work for change. And thank you and have a great afternoon and rest of your day.